Okay, thanks very much. I just want to talk today about ISRC, in some ways the sister standard to ISWC. Um, it's an international standard um, administered by ISO TC46, TC46 SC9. Um, what I want to say start, to start with is, I think you know, Mark and um, Jose have picked this up, but the music business obviously is a creative business but it's also a data business, and that ends up with uh, creative people doing all sorts of funky things, trying to talk to computers, and then let the computers talk to each other. And that's tricky, because um, artists like to create different names for themselves, different spellings, um, different titles, different versions of the same recording. And how on earth can we keep track of um, precisely which recording we're talking about, particularly if it's got different rights attached to it, or if it wants to be discriminated differently for payment purposes. So we need to give it like a number plate and assign an identifier to the recording so that people can be completely clear about what exactly they're talking about. And in that way, creative people can do their creative things and uh, computers will be able to talk to each other across networks of, um, you know, between studios, um, distributors, record companies, and um, DSPs. Um, what I want to talk about today is just to briefly survey what ISRC is, how to use it, um, to look at some of the rules around uniqueness and um, how to assign it and when not to assign it, look at the ISRC database, and <clears throat> look at the practical usage of ISRC. I'll also say some things about the global situation with ISRC and our plans, and of course, being in Toronto, ISRC in Canada. So, everything starts with, is that not quite on the screen, is it? Everything starts with the creator. So you have creators in a studio um, doing their thing, and they're probably going to produce a recording. One of the things that I want to mention is, what is a recording? Because people tend to get confused about this. Um, well, a recording, it's not the tape reel, it's not the hard drive, it's not the WAV file or the FLAC or whatever. A recording is the conceptual entity that's created when a recording captures a performative event. So the performers perform something and you capture that and that conceptual thing is the recording. Okay, And that is what we're identifying. That defines the granularity at which ISRC is assigned and used. So of course we assign an ISRC to the recording. And that's for life, that recording, that conceptual entity, what you technically call the first fixation, is identified by an ISSC, and that ISSC has to be used going forward. Also, quite possible that the, it's a new work that's created in the studio, because um, whether it's written down or not, um, a, a, you know, a work as an abstraction is created, and Jose has explained how that's identified by ISWC whether or not it's actually written down at the time. Coming back onto the ISRC, um, the ISRC is carried with the recording and its associated metadata everywhere the recording's used. So if you have different formats, if it's cut to vinyl, if it's on CD, if it's on um, a streaming service or an MP3 file or a lossless FLAC, um, that carries the, uh, the same ISRC that identifies the recording. It links back to the, the first fixation. That's what we're trying to identify. Um, and then if the product, which is a completely separate entity, as Mark explained earlier, is then distributed across different sales channels, the identifier for the recording needs to be carried along with that in the metadata. And DDEX provides a whole suite of mechanisms to do that across different types of sales channels and in collective management. Okay, and we can have a distribution. Maybe it's distributed by companies like Fuga or The Orchard. Um, when it's distributed, the same ISRC has to flow along with the recording so that we can have reporting back about sales and usage, and that can come back and provide the transparency that we need in the industry. And when the recording is licensed out for a compilation, it still needs to have the same ISRC. Don't give it a new one, because otherwise we'll all get in a muddle about what we're talking about. OK? So in the studio, quite
quite possible we'll have an alternative take. Now that is a different recording, so it needs a different ISRC. And it's quite possible that we'll make a remix. Many, many remixes, quite possibly. And they are different recordings, so they need to have different ISRCs. And this is one of the fundamental things about ISRC. When you've got different tracks, different takes made by the same artist with very similar names, we need to discriminate what they are exactly. Sometimes the remixes are made by other record companies under license, or DJs will remix it, and there's different rights holding, so we need to be very careful that we assign different ISRCs to different recordings so we can track them and account for them properly. And then you can ask me about remastering. I've shown this one in grey because it's a grey area. And it's not a grey area because we want to be um, mischievous. It's a grey area because when you remaster something, is it or isn't it a new recording? And it depends. Um, legally, if it's just a mere mechanical transcription of a tape reel into digital, that doesn't constitute a new object of copyright protection. There hasn't been a new performance involved. There's no new performative event. There's no new rights holding. It's not a new recording, and it should not have a new ISRC. But if you have a mastering engineer in the studio with the faders, perhaps you know, using signal processing to bring an instrument forward in the mix you know, to clarify things, arguably that could be a new recording. Now, I can't tell. I can run ISRC, and I can create rules by which to identify recordings, but I'm not in the studio, and I don't know how the you know, how much creative input there's been in creating a remaster. So we need a system that can allow those people who've created new recordings by dint of reworking old recordings to assign new ISRCs when they need to. And that's a gray area, and we can provide rules around it. Um, but it needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. I just want to say a couple of words about the actual structure of an ISRC. Um, it's very similar to ISWC. It's informed by the same principles of identification. Um, so we have only in printed visual form, we have a code identifier, the, IS, w, the, the ISRC that you sh see there. That's not part of the actual identifier. It just, when it's printed, you can see that, oh, this string of characters is an ISRC. And then we have two code elements. We have the country code. Here, this is Jamaica, um, JM, in Canada. Um, from the Canadian National ISRC Agency, you get CA. Then you have a registrant code, which uniquely discriminates the entity which may apply ISRCs under this code to its recordings. Then we have a year of reference element. This is uh, 14 for 2014. Um, and then finally we have five designation code digits, which allows up to 100,000 ISRCs to be issued per year under this registrant code. And then in the next year, it would go to 15. Now we're in 17. And you can get an another 100,000 ISRCs under that code. So what you get from the National ISRC Agency, and I'll come on to this when we talk about Canada later, is, is the first two code elements, the country code and the registrant code. And all around the world, they're either very inexpensive or totally free. And that enables producers of sound recordings to apply for a country code and a registrant code and allocate their ISRCs. One of the things. Um, is the country code doesn't identify the country in which the recording was made or the country in which the revenues have to be paid for. It's just part of a way of ensuring that identifiers can be allocated around the world that don't overlap with each other. I want to say a few more words about that later on. But that's a very important principle of ISRC. You shouldn't infer something from the country code. And when you store the ISRC in a computer, don't store the code identifier and don't store the hyphens. They're just there for readability. In a computer, it's just the 12 alphanumeric characters. Um, I want to say something about uniqueness. Uh, this is absolutely critical, and it's the area where we have the worst compliance issues in the ISRC system. Most people get it, and they understand it, and they assign an ISRC to the recording, as I explained it earlier on. Um, 
sometimes not, and that causes problems. If you assign two ISRCs to the same recording, then you double up the work. You know, it goes out onto a distributor, and maybe you change distributor a year later, and you take down one of them, you forget about the other one. You know, what, what happens then? Does, uh, you know, there's an orphan piece of metadata out there somewhere that would need to be dealt with. So it's really a problem if you, if you assign multiple ISRCs to the same recording. And very pleased to say that the instances where the same ISRC has been assigned to multiple recordings, which is disastrous, There's, that's numbers in the, you know, in the few hundreds around the world. It's very low numbers of that. that. That's really a problem. But this point about uniqueness ties back to granularity. As I've explained, the ISRC attaches to the recording and discriminates different recordings. Now, if you've got a different business purpose, if you're in an author society or you're working for a music publisher, you might want to link back several different versions of a recording to a composition. Um, so it's inherent that the, you know, the granularity rules around what constitutes a recording don't necessarily map one-to-one -one onto the granularity rules that you might need at a DSP. You know, in a DSP, you might want to know I've got mastered for iTunes or the original one or the radio edit or the original studio album release. Um, that's fine. Um, and in a, in a musical work society, you might want to know, well, I've got this work and I've got cover versions and remixes and, you know, so that it's not necessarily one-to-one -one mapping. But if we deviate from the uniqueness of assigning one ISRC to one recording at the recording level, then that causes a heck of a lot of problems for everybody else because they have to deal with that. Okay. Um, Mark mentioned his professorial view about reference descriptive metadata. And I want to just make it real. The reference metadata for ISRC is something which binds the ISRC to the recording. It, it links the ISRC to the, to the referent, to the recording that's identified by the ISRC. And we have six fields. We have the artist, title, and version. We have the duration of the recording. We have the type, whether it's a sound recording or music video, and the date of first publication. And the reason we have these things, and the reason they bind the ISRC to the recording, is because if any one of those things changes, we're talking about a different recording, right? If it's you know, got a different publication date, it's got to be a different recording. If it's by a different artist, it's got to be a different recording. So those six fields are the minimum things which absolutely link an ISRC to the recording, and they n must be stored along with the ISRC when one is assigned to a recording. Okay, um, the database. Um, the first thing probably to say with ISRC is it, it, the dissemination method for ISRC is along with the recording. Throughout all the value chains around the music industry, um, the ISRC is assigned before release of a recording, and it's included in the metadata in all the DDEX standards support it, and it's mandatory. Um, it's, it, it's not strictly mandatory if it's not available because it's an old historic recording or that it's a public domain recording and no one's assigned it, but it's, it's mandatory everywhere if it's available. It's mandatory at many DSPs and at um, quite a number of MLCs. And the way it's disseminated in the industry is along with the recording and along with the recording metadata. DDEX is the fantastic facilitator for that. Okay. But you might say, well, what happens if I'm not part of the industry value chain? How the heck do I find out about an ISRC? Um, so we have a database which has been created for us globally by Sound Exchange, um, where you can look up an ISRC and find out the data that it's associated with, or you can carry out a query and type in an artist and track and get a list of um, <clears throat> different recordings and their ISRCs that are associated with that. We have um, a, you know, what metadata people call a query and a resolution service. Um, and then there's advanced search capability where you can um, drill into it and you can look at all the release level information for a recording um, because a recording can be um, disseminated to the public on many, many different products or releases. Um, and it's possible to unroll that in the international ISRC database. Um, I did on the previous slide have the um, URLs for that, but you can just type 
ISRC search into your favorite search engine and you will find it. <coughs> and just to say that the database that's been built by Sound Exchange, it includes 32 million, um, <coughs> excuse me, 32 million ISRCs, 23 million unique. Um, it uh, has 6,500 rights owners providing their information directly into Sound Exchange's database, including the majors and many independents. Um, it also has 52 DDEX ERN feeds providing data from aggregators like the Orchard CI. Um, I don't know if Fuga does, but many, many aggregators, so 52 DDEX ERN feeds providing data. Sound Exchange gets about 300,000 new ISRCs a month into its database and it provides a public web-based lookup service and there's a shopping cart facility down there that you can put 5,000 search results in and download them as a spreadsheet if you want to import them into your system. Okay, on um, usage of ISRC, as I said, the music industry is a data industry. So, you know, you've got your ISRC, what do you do with it? I think there, there are three main areas of practical usage that you can look at. Firstly, in your own database, you need to be clear about what recordings you have. So you're going to enter the ISRC into your database or if you're a tiny company, perhaps a spreadsheet and store it alongside all the other information about the recordings. And it helps you manage your own data about your recordings. Then there's the DSP scenario. You're going to provide it to DSPs. And there the benefit is that it really helps with the administration of the recordings in the DSP database and reporting. Enables the DSP to report back to you about sales based on something precise and tangible, the identifier of the recording. And then the third area is in the collective management world. In, you need to register the ISRC with Connect Resound in Canada, Sound Exchange in the US, PPL in the UK, and they use it to manage the rights and recordings information in their databases so that they can um, process reports that they get from radio against something and report back against it. And there's a push in the record industry at the moment for track level reporting from all MLCs, and that track level reporting includes ISRC. And then when you get reports back from the MLC, including ISRC, you can map it into your own database and report through transparently to artists and other people that need to know how the recordings are used. So really the benefits of ISRC are to enable you to properly manage repertoire information, rights in databases and data exchange right throughout the recording industry. Just to say, um, globally, uh, as I mentioned, ISRC is a international standard managed by ISO. It's been standardized since um, 1989. It was created by IFPI and Philips before that, and then made into the standard um, ISO 3901. The latest revision is the 2001 revision. We're revising it again at the moment, and that will enable, if you remember back, I showed you the structure with a country code and a registrant code. There's all manner of confusion about what the country code means. It, it doesn't mean anything. It's part of the way of allocating codes, but we're removing that to get rid of the confusion and calling those five characters a prefix code. We're also providing a mechanism for automated assignment of ISRC, which is a little bit similar to some of the things that CSAC is doing, where you can submit reference metadata and get an ISRC back. That's allowed for in the new standard. And there are some sort of technical improvements to the standard. One of the other things which is very important is outreach. We're very keen on trying to improve outreach, and that's become, um, I think, something that's been pushed in ISO across all its identifier standards. Um, reach out to the community of people who use the identifier standard and consult with them and take on board their inputs about what we need to do with the standard, and, and we'll be doing more of that. Finally, I just want to come on to Canada. Um, in Canada, ReSound administers the ISRC system on behalf of Connect and ultimately Music Canada. Um, this is in the context of the project that was completed between Connect and ReSound last year, which has eliminated 
duplicative activity between the two organizations. That's made a huge benefit. It's resulted in elimination of, I think, cost by about one, about one third of the cost. And a lot of the technical work has gone to resound. It means that the data flows are improved and there's been um, a faster distribution and uh, better data quality. Um, there, there are plans at Resound for um, improving the data quality of ISRC in Canada as well. And one of those is on radio reporting. Resound has been pushing the record companies and the radio broadcasters to use ISRC in a better way. And there are two flows. One is from the record companies to radio broadcasters. The other is from the radio broadcasters to Resound. And for the, for the, for the major labels, they are pushing out ISRC at the 100% level at the moment. And I think Resound is on the point of doing some testing about how it's going to improve the match rate and finding that there's some very big improvements to the way they can do matching in their database, um, accuracy, speed, and performance. So um, that's it. The, um, I, the contact information for obtaining an ISRC in Canada is there. It's still a connect, um, a connect email, but the admin is done by Resound. Any questions? My, the question I had was related to uh, the country code, which you just said that you're going to remove in the next version of the ISRC code. Or rename it to prefix. Yes, rename it. I think that it's a crucial uh, first information to get. It's like, where is the guy who owns the recording so that he can get his money back? And so, uh, for example, as a Belgian producer, if my music is being played in Japan, you know, JazzRack knows that it should send the money back to the Sabam first before finding me out. So my question was, how does a company such as TuneCore has got its own country code, TC? Uh, is it related to any uh, localization? The other question is, how many private companies has got their own country code not related to a geographical position? And uh, how do we deal with the fact that it might create confusion is if, as an independent producer, I ask TuneCore to create a, an RSS code for my music, and then a label like Warner likes, likes my track and want to release it into another country? Yeah, yeah that's, I mean, that's a fair question. I'm very glad you've answered it, because uh, you've asked it, because there's a, there's a, a huge misunderstanding about what the country code means in ISRC. Um, it's, we, we follow well-organized principles of identification which have been established by all the identifier experts, ISO and the work of the index um, and the Link Content Coalition, that it's completely wrong to embed information into the identifier. The identifier should be and is in the ISRC system a dumb number. It's, it's, uh, it's categorically wrong to infer that the country code means that rights or payments should route to there. And the reason is simple, because, you know, catalogs change, companies buy other companies. And if you've embedded that information, you know, say, say a Belgian producer has a catalog and they're paid in Belgium. Now they sell it to a French producer. If, the, if, if people misinterpret that the country code means that the money should be routed to Belgium, now it's all of a sudden going to the wrong place. So we really don't want that. And the right answer is to store the data about rights owning in a database which is indexed by the ISRC so that when you receive an ISRC, you look in the database and you go, oh, hang on, the rights owner is so-and-so in Belgium. I know exactly who it is and when their rights holding started, when it finished. Perfect. And you can pay accurately. But it's a really, really bad, reprehensible, wrong practice to try to infer something about ownership or the destination of money from digits in the identifier code. Okay, I can't agree more with what Richard said about the, we should understand that there's a historic reason that this happened. Before the internet, the ISRC standard is much older than the ISWC standard. At that point in time, we had no internet and we had no centralized databases. The only way to ensure uniqueness was to have them assigned in each country and to do that 
ISO standard operating procedure was to use a country code. It is, again, very dangerous to assume that any of these codes have any meaning about ownership or territory. They do not. There are sound recording owners who are registered in other territories for various reasons, as Richard mentioned. Catalogs are sold and there's like five other reasons why this can happen. Please don't assume because you see a country code that it's from that country. As a publisher, um, obviously our works can be used in many different ISRCs um, and often historically we haven't had necessarily the software to track them and or the inclination to do so. Um, should we want to do so, do you have a similar service whereby we can look up and, and associate these ISRCs to our works or, or service you with work data in order to try and capture ISRC data? Yeah, there's, uh, there's a, I mean I, I don't have the whole answer to that. Um, because it's quite a complicated uh, question, as you know well. And there's work going on all over the place in, in terms of linking the recordings and the works information together. DDEX is helpfully creating a project register of linking initiatives around the world and standardizing a message that will be able to exchange the information about the links between recordings and works, hopefully with the ISWC and ISRC embedded into that, um, into that link. But we have, um, we have a database with the, that's run for us by Sound Exchange, as I explained. It's got good international coverage, not complete, but good. And publishers have been, you know, we track how it's been used, and publishers have been among the first and foremost users of that database in order to download information about the ISRCs and products that their works have been used on. To me, the, the streaming DSPs are, are likely a good house for some of these connections whereby they have to remit the information to the various MROs and PROs and they also have to do it to their recording societies so they probably have built the data loops so um, you know they're the key holders of a lot of this information even if they're not the key consumers of a lot of this information and uh, it would be neat to, to leverage whatever links they may have made um, between these sound recordings and yeah hallelujah works. for that uh, absolutely. Um, and it's not the only place, by the way. Mechanical licensing is another stage where there's a clear link between the recording and the work that's used. Um, and, so there are, and, and of course, there are entities. Sound Exchange has got its MDX database project. PPL has been working with PRS. Um, and I think um, you know, CSAC has been working with, with BMAT and its partners. There are a large number of initiatives, which um, actually DDEX has enumerated. I can't remember them all off the top of my head. Um, where work to um, put these links together in an authoritative way is going on, and we need to leverage that. Absolutely. Hallelujah to that. Um, so, yes, yeah, speaking as a mechanical licensing collective, we have received over the years a, a good amount of um, recordings, multiple recordings linked to the same ISRCs, even though they're different recordings. So the question I have is how, how does that get fixed over time? Like how do we, when we run across it, because we certainly have long lists of this stuff, how, because oh, we get them, those ISRCs them. from multiple can sources, right? What's that? Can, can you send them to me? In, in our studies, we've only found a very low number of cases where the same ISRC has been used on different recordings. There was a, a study run across, um, I think I can say this, EMI's database of half a million recordings, and EMI was not the best on, on ISRC compliance, and there were 200 instances where the, where the same recording had been identified, or different recording had been identified by the same ISRC. But if you have data on it, please send it to me. That, that was exactly going to be my question. Thank you. I'll do that. Yeah, I'm still not quite clear of, of when to get a new ISRC, ISRC code. For instance, in 2015, I released this a CD, right? And next year, I released an, um, a deluxe version of that CD with the same songs, just with a different title, a different year. Do I need a, a, a new no, ISRC? No, no, you don't. If that? it's the same recording, it, has to have, it must have the same ISRC. And if you mistakenly assign a new ISRC just because it's on a new product, mm -hmm. um, then you'll cause yourself problems in the long run because you'll have multiple and problems for other people because you'll have multiple ISRCs which are linked to the same recording. So how do I fix that? The, the, the release well, that you're creating, that needs a new identifier to differentiate between 
the uh, last year's package and this year's new package. Yeah, for the, for they the need to have new For identity. the sound recording. Right? But it's the same sound recording as Richard said. Yeah, this, uh, because, uh, you know. No, it's a different sound recording, but it's like the songs on that recording would, that would need the same ISRC code. That's well, what you if, sorry, I, I, I think I missed that. Did you, you re-record? No. I took the same set of songs, just a new name for the, the album, a same different year. ISRC. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but oh, the, no. so they're the same recordings. You, you've, you've, um, you know, the, the, the way it works, at the, at the top level, you have the musical work, the composition. Then you have, then you've, you know, band in a studio, you've recorded it, okay, and then underneath that, you've released it on, you know, presumably multiple different sales channels, iTunes, Spotify, on CDs, and now you're releasing a new bonus CD. If the recording is the same, you haven't edited it, you haven't remixed it, uh, it must have the same ISRC on all of those channels. But at the sales level, at the product level, you can have there are release identifiers. I think. Um, uh, one of the DDEX secretariat will talk about this momentarily, so it's a great segue you've made. But there are release and product identifiers that are used to chat, track product in the sales channel. And this comes back to the, the granularity point. When you carry out identification, you need to identify, you often need to identify the same thing for different purposes. Okay? And you, you could notionally think that the, you know, the recording is the same thing, but when you embody it onto a product, you're actually identifying the product for a sales channel purpose, and that has to have a product identifier. The recording has to have its recording identifier, and then the musical work has to have its work identifier. And those things are all needed because there are different business purposes and different levels at which you need to discriminate things for, you know, for different purposes. Is there, and so I, I saw where you showed the website, and you can do individual queries of, of different tracks you know, to look up an IRSRC. But for those that have music catalogs that have 100,000, 200,000 songs in there, and some of these songs are outdated, they were added many, many years ago, is there a more automated way to scrub an existing catalog against the ISRC digital catalog? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. There, there, there isn't properly at the moment, but we're working on it. Um, you know, there's some amount of inertia in the music industry and we've given a huge push and, and thankfully sound exchange has step, stepped forward and solved a problem for us. They do have an API um, and that API is in use for bulk transfer of information to some of their select business partners in the US and um, we just need to push a bit more and make sure that we can open that up for other legitimate business purposes and uses around the world. Um, oh, you so you should you be a business have, partner of, yeah, of yeah. Sound Exchange. You should be able to get yeah. the API. So, yeah, you should. That should be straightforward for you. Um, so I've I have a question, and and this is something that's not going to be relevant for another, I guess, since I saw C. The first ones were probably assigned when in ninety one. Was is that right? Or yeah, the, I think. Um, in the very, you might see a few with earlier dates than that, because in the very first year of ISRC system, it was permitted to assign with the year with of the release. Year of release the year yeah. code. So, so just as the country code is not relevant in terms of you know rights holder, um, yeah. the year is not relevant in terms of you know no, because no, it no, should no, be you, the you year the ISRC was, was allocated yeah, or yeah. assigned. So, but it's only two digits. Yeah. So what happens in 2091? Do you well, have an expanded? We, we you, the, <laughs> not that any right. of us yep. are going to. Yep. Well, absolutely right. Maybe. So we, we have a process where we track uh, the year codes in ISRCs against registrant codes, and because of the that rule in the first year, we see some that have got dates of 21 in for 1921, and uh, I've seen some that had uh, 17 for 1917, and we we track that and we write to the controller, the registrant, you can say, the controller of that registrant code, and let them know that they're just about to hit their small Y2K problem, and we give them a new code so that they can carry on assigning new ISRCs under a new registrant code, and not loop round and start assigning, you know, with duplicative ambiguous dates. And, and one more question. So does DDEX allow for multiple ISRCs? Because that, that's, it, it is an issue. 
It does, yeah. We and, and it's obviously relevant in certain cases, not all, but, you know, for it, the purposes of in the PROs and things like that. Not in all the standards, does it? Um, ERN, I don't believe it does, but in the MLC standard, there's a, an associated sound recording ID, which has been created specifically to deal with that. So you have a preferred ISRC and then an associated sound recording ID, which can be carried. And that was... Um, that you know, that's that's necessary to deal with the issue as you as you mentioned. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Yes, there is another question. Sorry, you said that earlier. <laughs> I'm not sure on the specific numbers, but on, on the slides, it looked like uh, when you were talking about the number of ISRCs that are assigned, there was like something like 32 million. Yeah, in sound exchanges database versus 23 million unique yeah, yeah. ISRCs? Yeah. Because how, how does that happen? Like, is um, that, to me, that sounds the, like a problem. Um, I, thank <laughs> you. The, there are two different views of how to structure data in the, in the music business, um, at least two. One is, one is product-centric, okay? So, in, you know, most record companies in the old days had a product-centric database. They'd have, um, you know, albums and compilations and re-releases and so the same recording could be in the record company database, you know, multiple different times because it was appearing on different products. It's a product-centric world. Okay, that's fine if you're shipping product. But if you want to manage rights, either in the recording or in the work, um, you don't want that. You want a recording-centric view of the data where the top thing is the recording and then hanging underneath it, you've got a lot of different product configurations. Um, and so um, what happens is Sound Exchange receives product-centric data from record companies, and then they rejig it all, deduplicate it to the ISRC level, and roll it up so that you get um, a unique ISRC in Sound Exchange. Um, there are fewer unique ones than the registered ones, but under that unique ISRC, there are lots of product informations, and the, and the 32 million ISRCs that um, Sound Exchange receives a raw before deduplication and they relate to this the same ISRC that's been issued on lots of different products. 